Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to uh, those on, uh, who are on the webcast, uh, and good afternoon for uh, those who are here. Um, it's a pleasure uh, for us to be here, if I may speak to Margie, um, and uh, just to share with you some of the things that we've been working on uh, really the last three, four years, uh, thinking about how to uh, really link the extremely poor into, uh, into markets. And uh, we're going to start with a video produced by FHI 360 a Field Leader with Associates. Uh, and a number of programs have been using uh, this to introduce uh, the concepts to their staff. Uh, also, it's on the Microlinks website and on YouTube if you want to download it. So uh, all being well, shall we begin with the video? For very poor producers, we all know that getting ahead in the marketplace is not easy. The challenges they face are varied and can't be addressed by business as usual. They produce in quantities too small for most buyers. They can only buy inputs like seeds and fertilizers in small quantities from suppliers, so they end up paying more. They don't feel confident in formal markets. They are unable to travel long distances to buy and sell. They may have limited knowledge of markets and ability to take on risk. They are often driven by social norms and expectations. So, what do we do? Introducing the Field Guide, designed to provide field practitioners with tools and applications to integrate very poor producers into value chains by, number one, strengthening vertical relationships between very poor producers and their buyers and suppliers. Number two, strengthening horizontal relationships among producers to address risk, trust, and confidence. What's inside? A key terms and a glossary. Practitioner tools. Step-by-step -step worksheets. And real field examples from around the globe. For example, the Girl Effect, Value Girls Program, and Kenya. Livelihood Recovery and Post-Cyclone Bangladesh Food Security, Productive Safety Nets in Ethiopia To download a copy of this valuable resource, visit microlinks.org Search the term Field Guide This video and the Field Guide were made possible by the generous support of the American people through the United States Agency for International Development through a cooperative agreement between USAID and FHI 360 and its partners including World Vision. The contents are the responsibility of World Vision and FHI 360 and do not necessarily reflect the views of USAID or the United States government. As we, as we think about actually we're, we're looking in terms of uh, moving forward and uh, making a few changes in the guide as we are looking at a third edition of the guide, and one of that is, um, as we think about the uh, post-2015 uh, agenda, uh, the post-MDG uh, uh, agenda, one of the, the most likely uh, goal uh, is going to be uh, ending extreme poverty. And so the UN Secretary General has called to end extreme poverty and um, um, by 2030, so from 2015 to 2030. So the question is, as an economic development community, what can we do to contribute to goal number one in the next 15 years? And what can we do uh, to uh, uh, really link the uh, extremely poor in, into those markets? The, the Economist last year came out with this was their cover, uh, their cover graphic. I don't know if, if, if you saw it, and, and I was quite taken by it. Um, as we think about, again, the next 15 years, the development agenda, and towards the end of extreme poverty, um, starting out in 1990, 2 billion people lived in extreme poverty below $1.25 a day or the equivalent in 1990. Now, it, it has reduced quite a bit up to 2014. 
And the UN uh, report uh, as of May 31 was really looking at and lauding uh, the, 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 the most uh, reduction in extreme poverty uh, that we've ever seen on the face of the earth. So the, in terms of very positive trends, so this is looking now from 2014, or at that time, 2013, uh, due to 2030. And to get uh, that many people out of poverty, uh, obviously markets plays an incredible role. And to have more inclusive markets, to have a better linkage of private sector buyers uh, to, to producers and also input suppliers uh, to producers, uh, as well as, uh, as li better linkage of producers to producer uh, collaboration. We wanted to give a few examples of some of the things we've been exploring and discovering as we've done this work. And, um, we thought we'd give examples of unintended impacts of some of the market growth. Um, we're going to use women as an example, but this could be for any poorer or vulnerable populations. And we know that um, many of the programs that we're seeing are doing things such as introducing new technologies, introducing new agricultural practices, doing things as shifting to high value crops, um, introducing new market channels, which we often see as very positive introducing new storage facilities, um, formalizing various contracting instruments, um, and introducing more formalized financial requirements. Um, the guide actually has many worksheets which take um, program staff through looking at some of these unintended consequences and what they can do around those. Um, so to talk through some of those examples, um, so we see these emerging more and more and having a real impact on working with and trying to benefit the very poor. Um, just to talk through some of the examples um, of what we're often seeing in market development programs that are maybe having um, less of a lens on the very poor or not recognizing what some of those unintended consequences are. Often when we think of something like introducing new technologies and agricultural practices, what we may not be thinking about is that women may therefore be spending, um, they may no longer have income opportunities, especially poor landless women. Um, as day laborers to provide land clearing and weeding services, for example, which is often a, a, a key initial um, income generator. Maybe there's change time allocation. So women are actually um, spending less time in the field. Maybe it's positive. Maybe they're managing household activities, including finances in different ways. But maybe this could also change safety conditions. Um, often women, uh, new technologies and ag practices lead to the introduction of using heavier or less safe equipment. And what this can often lead to are higher rates of injuries with um, people that are less nourished, women. Um, it's often leading to higher incidence of miscarriage, for example. Another common improvement in market systems is a shift to high value crops. But we often see that this, in a way, can alter control over resources. Um, women, for example, may have less ability to decide um, which product produce or how much produce goes to the market and how much is instead retained for the family to consume. Men may want to maximize income and may therefore want to use the produce as an income source um, rather than as food for the family. Um, you know, this is particularly uh, challenging when high value crops may not be food crops, um, but rather cash crops. And it often may lead the household to be actually more insecure. Another challenge in shifting to higher value crops that we may not often foresee and need to program around is uh, altering the control over benefits. Um, as income rises, there may be increased conflict within the household over decisions on how much to spend on food or medicine for the family, for example. And there are incidents where we're looking at examples of higher incidence of physical abuse for women as one of the unintended consequences. Um, another improvement in market systems is the introduction of new market channels. And part of what we've been trying to understand is what does the effect have on the very poor um, in this case? Um, in a, from the perspective of women, for example, there may be the need with new market channels 
to access childcare, which actually wasn't needed before, um, as, so that women are actually able to participate in certain markets more actively. Um, another example is that this may, there may be a risk um, of decreasing women's ability to nurse babies for a healthy length of time um, because they're having to travel um, to new areas and undertake tasks without their babies in this particular case, which we know has a long-term um, economic impact too. Uh, there may also be changes in the routes that are traveled when introducing new market channels. Um, maybe uh, the vulnerable, especially women, have to travel to on less safe routes to be able to access new markets, to be able to access inputs, for example. We know another improvement in market development um, and market systems is often the introduction of new storage facilities, <coughs> things like warehouse receipt programs um, or farm storage programs. Um, and often this also decreases uh, some members of the household, often women's ability to retain certain food um, and produce as, as food for the homes. Another improvement is the formalization of contracting instruments. We know this is something we often are um, advocating for and, and facilitating. And what we recognize is that the formalization of contracting instruments can often formalize the ownership of land and equipment, which can also change household dynamics and cause conflict um, uh, at the household level. There's also often the increased pressure for women to transact with sex as a form of contract compliance, um, something we, we need to spend time thinking through. Um, and the last example I'll give is improvements in market systems um, often include the introduction of formalized financial requirements, something we're advocating for. We recognize that this often changes income control. Um, for example, there might be um, initiatives such as contracting farming, uh, there might be certain cooperative memberships, warehouse receipt programs, um, things that often require the opening of a bank account. Bank accounts are often opened in the name of men heading the household. Um, buyers often make payments directly into these bank accounts. And this removes, for example, women or whoever's controlling income in the household, women's knowledge of what income is being received and access to this income to be used for other um, forms within the household. Um, women, for example, um, uh, more vulnerable women, uh, the very poor, are often not in favor of these more formal act financing financial structures um, that can decrease their control um, over income. Uh, and also, you know, changing financial management um, is one of the, the things that can result. And often, uh, women can no longer hide how much income um, they are allocating to spend on food or medicine at school, which maybe not all household members are supporting. Um, so these have been particularly interesting um, examples that have emerged in terms of doing improvements in market systems um, but, and facilitating improvements in market systems, but not recognizing necessarily what do we need to change or do differently when working with the, the very poor. So as we think about those kinds of concerns and, and looking at uh, very complex situations, um, we have tried to really focus on the uh, frontline workers, those market facilitators who, who facilitate those linkages. And one of the, one of the uh, worksheets regards uh, the vertical linkages are between the buyer and supplier, or buyer and producer, and also the producer and, and the supplier. So different kinds of linkages here, producers to traders, and what are some advantages and disadvantages to that in terms of certainly convenience, but obviously uh, lower prices for the farmers, uh, producers to retailers or their wholesalers. Uh, again, advantages and disadvantages, uh, certainly in terms of uh, higher standards, uh, but, but uh, you know, higher uh, transport costs, but also then also uh, uh, you know, better prices for the, for the farmers. Uh, looking at village agents, and, and, and Margie's going to share in terms of village agents uh, just a bit. Uh, linkages to agro-processors, again, some advantages and disadvantages. 
uh, producers to exporters. And uh, one of the case studies in the field guide is the Haiti Multi-Year Assistance Program, where the program linked uh, producer groups to directly to the exporters in, in mangoes uh, for those uh, very high value uh, mango francique uh, to Toronto and Miami and New York and, and, uh, and to London. And uh, a lot of work in terms of building that relationship uh, and even certification uh, both for the exporters and for the producer groups uh, in terms of organic and fair trade certification. And looking and working toward uh, contracts so there might be a clear uh, understanding uh, between all the parties. And uh, it's been, uh, you know, really quite successful. It's been ongoing beyond the life of the project. Uh, one year later, just talked with the, one of our uh, uh, contractors, uh, one of the uh, local firms that have been uh, doing this, uh, and said it's really going on quite well, uh, including the uh, certification. Uh, so that's been uh, very positive. Also in terms of uh, producers to larger scale farms, uh, contract farming, again, there's a lot of positives in terms of uh, technical assistance, uh, sometimes even inputs uh, on credit, uh, but there's also uh, some disadvantages for extremely poor producers in terms of uh, what if the uh, pr price that you have contracted is actually lower than the price, uh, market price at the, at the time. One of the many examples that we've been looking at and that have been fed through in, um, and feature in the guide is a recognition that one of the important, one of the, the lack of access to inputs is a, is a critical constraint to very poor producers. And um, we've been looking at programs that are uh, introducing the concept of village agents, community agents, um, call different things in different places. Um, at times, uh, agents that are selected by the community and have linkages with a input supplier or several input supply agents who are actually able to travel um, to input suppliers, able to bulk orders of inputs, and able to um, uh, transport these to where very poor communities, often rural communities, are and, and don't, who don't traditionally have access to these types of inputs. And we've recognized that the trust issue is really critical, that community members want to trust the um, trust people who are advocating for inputs when traditionally maybe inputs haven't been used or they haven't been used well, so people have lost faith in those inputs. And um, so the very poor can actually trust someone who's giving them that information and people are closer at hand and giving the correct types of technical assistance um, and uh, can actually act as sort of a go-between to input suppliers who are not often catering to the very poor, believing they don't have the income to actually buy inputs um, or the interest in purchasing inputs. Um, but recognizing that if these can be bulked um, and that if someone actually acts as the, uh, a relationship builder, and this can have quite a breakthrough um, for very poor producers. Some of the interesting programs are doing work around taking that a step further in recognizing that often very poor producers have very limited access to resources. So what do you do if you have an access to resources and where do you, where do you go next? What's your starting point? But using um, sort of traditional, modern retail um, practices, uh, there's um, a lot of interesting things being done with input suppliers, as an example, who are um, looking at ways to promote inputs to um, very poor producers through giving out samples, for example, um, giving uh, discounts when a lot's going to be sold at a particular season, um, running promotional stands in rural areas, giving demonstrations and, um, and giving out samples in those areas. Often those type of retail practices, giving discounts, giving samples, um, using SMS for e-discounts to kind of target a certain population, means that the um, very uh, poor producers are actually able to access some of these things without needing to go and get credit, for example, or, or um, access finance in different ways. So it's really trying to match often what traditional retail, modern retail practices can be to be able to serve a potentially huge market for input suppliers, but where there's some stepping stones needed, both in terms of behavior change and also in terms of initial access with limited, um, limited access to resources.
We developed a, a journal article uh, at the Enterprise Development and Microfinance Journal and looked at some of the, uh, what have we learned in terms of building frontline uh, market facilitators uh, capacity and, and looking at the field guide as a, as a case study in that. And uh, this is just uh, from the, uh, from the, um, uh, from the article and it, and it is an online survey is one thing that we did and, and uh, and the practical tool around linking very poor producers to buyers and suppliers. As we, I think we're all wrestling with that uh, and, and what are some ways uh, that uh, we can do that and certainly um, the, the uh, village agents is, uh, is, a, is a emerging way that uh, um, has, a, has a lot of promise. Um, but also the other thing that we learned in terms of the 70% uh, people People learn 70% experiential, 20% uh, from others, and 10% from formal. Uh, that ratio is, was really challenging as, as we looked at the uh, as we looked at the results and and the workshops. Uh, we're a bit disappointed in terms of how much people actually learned in those workshops. Uh, so, what are some ways as a community as we think about working with frontline workers uh, to build their capacity? And particularly as, as frontline workers uh, are faced very complex situations, uh, a lot of different, uh, um, cl with climate change, certainly economic uh, changes, uh, how, with very poor producers, how are you going to make those linkages uh, into markets? Our colleague from Tanzania yesterday asked in one of the uh, workshops, what about frontline workers? How do we include those? frontline workers in the conversation around developing certainly uh, the, the, the practical ways of, uh, of making these linkages, but also how can we also learn from them in terms of what they're learning, uh, say, as they face their day-to-day -day, uh, challenges applying market uh, systems concepts. So on your tables, uh, there's a flyer, so if we could if uh, you could uh, pass that around. Um, we would encourage you to download and distribute uh, the field guide, there's 22 tools. We've just shown you a couple of the tools. Uh, organizations have used the tools to, to train frontline staff. We have nearly 4,000 users. According to a uh, knowledge manager, the most downloaded field support resource uh, on microlinks. Um, and so that, uh, you know, that, that has been a, a real, uh, that's been wonderful in terms of getting that out into the field. So we're again working on a, a third edition to uh, uh, bring the uh, field guide uh, more into, uh, you know, mar certainly market facilitation uh, uh, thinking. Just some uh, examples of users uh, in terms of uh, the use of the field guide. One uh, person said, I use the guide to provide technical backstopping in the development of project designs and concept papers. So the benefit of, of just having it as a, as a resource uh, to provide that technical backstopping. A project manager in Malawi said she has developed a plan of action at the program level on the implementation of the guide within the selected value chains. So again, in terms of uh, program uh, program uh, implementation uh, because it is implementation where uh, you know it really is the key uh, in terms of uh, execution. So we really appreciate your work and and uh, field has been going on for nine years. Is, is that is that right? Nine years. Paul, is that right? Nine years. So it's been a nine-year journey together, and I think as we look forward uh, and working together. Um, you know, that, that involvement of, of, of our community contributing to that post-2015 uh, agenda. And what are the tools that we bring uh, to that uh, really number one goal of the uh, post-2015 agenda. And so we're going to uh, hand it over to you at your tables. Uh, and if you could, and if you want to join tables, that's fine. But chat just a bit about what have you done to, uh, to facilitate and allow suppliers to reach uh, extremely poor producers, again, those below $1.25 a day. 
to have buyers reach uh, extremely poor producers. Uh, and with uh, vulnerable producers uh, linking with other producers, what are some things uh, that you have done? And so what we're going to do is maybe have uh, five minutes or so in your tables, uh, and then we'll have a sharing uh, in the large group. So over to you. So some, uh, some quick examples of... Um, sorry, if I could just have everybody for a moment as you are still sharing at your tables. We just want some quick examples of uh, the kinds of practices, ex things that people, you've seen people trying, programs have tried, they might be your own, they may be things that you're familiar with, that are trying to extend benefit to very poor producers and trying to incorporate them increasingly. Just some of the examples, you don't have to go into any quick depth, but just anyone, just wave your hand and they'll bring a quick microphone over if you can just say your name and organization and something that you're aware of that's being done in this area. Great, we have one over here in the front, in the middle. Uh, so one thing that was mentioned in my group, and sorry. that didn't come from me, it came from you. And sorry, your name and... Uh, sorry, Malini Tolit with Save the Children. Uh, we were talking about how it's really important as well to first get very poor producers to understand the value of using improved inputs in order for them to link with the input suppliers. And, and something we've used in our project is initially providing vouchers uh, that connects them to the input suppliers. They get used to the transaction. They invest in the technology and see the value of it. And that sort of is a way of getting that interaction going and creating the linkage and the input suppliers as well see that there is a market here if, you know, it, if it works out, <laughs> that is. Great, thank you for sharing that. And especially if those vouchers are channeled through the private sector so people become familiar with that as a mechanism and someone that they're interacting with. Thank you. Hi, my name is Michelle. I'm with FHI 360. Um, we came about with the marketing cooperatives, um, and farmers usually are members of these cooperatives, and so they have you know access to different services. Uh, and so when they have their product, uh, when when they have produced something, they they have the cooperatives basically help them sell um, to a wider market. So for instance, milk um, could be processed further through those cooperatives and then sold to a wider market. Um, there are a couple of other ideas this group had. It's really interesting, but I'll just... I'll, <laughs> she, she had more to talk about in terms of the village agent, so I'll pass it on to her. And, and just on the cooperatives, thank you for that example. We, we've seen that so, many, so often the very poor producers are forming some type of group, and we're definitely not advocating for groups for the per sake of groups, which I think often happens, but rather for when is there more access to certain things, um, whether it's certain markets, whether it's certain access to inputs, um, because people are, are forming or, or connecting with others for either a long-term or a short-term period that is of benefit to them. And a, a lot of guidelines around that and lessons learned. Thank you. Um, okay, my name is uh, Margaret Masbay. I work in, um, for Swiss Contact in Tanzania Rural Livelihoods Development Program. Um, I think for, in terms of inputs, it's a similar model to what Maggie talked about, which is using village agents or, or what are they called? The community members who are trusted by other communities to do the bulking and so on and so forth. But I think I would like to just share on the seed issue, improved seed. My program has, because in Tanzania, the law allows for production of, of quality approved seeds, mm. So, and you know, the challenge, of course, is uh, poor farmers affording improved seeds. They tend to be very expensive. So our program um, has promoted um, certain lead, you know, selected farmers within the village who, again, are based on trust, who have been trained to produce, uh, re reproduce quality seeds in their fields. And then now that brings the quality improved seed very close to the farmer, 
and the price is almost about 10, 20% of the cost of improved seeds if you are to get it from the usual input supplier who is very far anyway. Um, I, I mean, there's much more involved in that because you have to have a quality certificate, uh, certification system in place and so on and so forth. But it's working extremely well and um, the farmers are able to produce huge amounts of seed and some of the processors have then linked into that system and they are buying that seed from the quality improved seed from the farmers and then distributing them through their informal kind of setup um, contract uh, farming system. Excellent example, thank you for that. We, we had a workshop a couple of weeks ago and we had a seed expert uh, in, the, in the workshop and she was saying in terms of the research is that the, a lot of the, um, the seed, improved seed, is, is through uh, informal channels. Uh, so looking certainly at the formal uh, channels but also the informal channels as we try to have farmers increase the use of uh, improved seed. Thank you very much. Other examples? I see some folks uh, volunteering other folks. So. <laughs> Great. Are, are the, please, Paul. Just a... Uh, We'd, wait, we'd wait like you to microphone. stay on topic, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> microphone. I, I was wondering, uh, given this, uh, this morning's session on the Kinefin framework, how this fits into that model. Yeah, I, th I think, um, and again, our, our, our colleague from Tanzania asked the question yesterday. So, you know, what about the frontline workers? It is the frontline workers who are faced with the complexity of uh, dealing with uh, climate change, dealing with changing economic conditions, dealing with uh, different political conditions, religious conditions, uh, and they are the ones that we really need to equip to be able to adapt. Uh, and even within uh, households, you know, this is a focus on producers, but I mean, I was just making notes on the way here today. We, we need to work on off-farm income and non-farm income and be thinking about those, uh, uh, you know, Gene Downing cited the report of, uh, of you know, the number of people who are going to uh, be food insecure by 2050. So what are we going to do about the rural economies and, um, and, and those households? So helping those households also be thinking, you know, economically around their different options in a very complex, changing, uh, even in sometimes chaotic situation. So it is, how is us here, and, and, and I'm saying you know, globally, those who are also listening, equip those frontline workers and equip those households uh, in terms of, uh, of, of dealing with very complex situations. And Paul, that also leads us directly to the next session, I think, which is a, a key part of what we'll be talking about. One last question, and then I think we're, we will we will end. Um, I have a question about the gender aspects of linking the very poor households and producers with input suppliers. I suppose most of the input suppliers are male just because it's easier for them to have the required mobility, but you know, especially countries with a lot of uh, Muslim women who are heads of household who are among the very poor we're targeting. I wonder if that would be an impediment to access. And so I wonder if anyone's uh, dealt at all with this issue of the gender aspects of the, the linkage problem. Any examples in the room? I think uh, one example I'll mention in case anyone else is busy thinking of some others. Um, the example I think the table over there shared regarding using community agents and village agents is often one one uh, model being tested um, where agents themselves can be the type of people, whether it's the gender issue, whether it's um, something else that people feel a relationship with, have already had a relationship with, select themselves that can act as a, rep a representative. Um, so that's one way of getting to that space. But I think there are other um, 
there are also other examples of what's being done, and it's quite context specific as to what is the issue, and is it limited mobility? Is it um, a power dynamic that exists? Is it a resource control? Is it an asset or land ownership control? Um, and therefore, what are things that people are putting in place to, to counter that or work within those conditions? I believe we have a question from the webcast. We do, we have a question from in Indra Klein. We actually have two questions, so we'll start with the first. With regard to cultural social challenges, what conversations are taking place with women to resolve current required financial practices, thus further gaining their trust and empowering them? Do you want to respond to that and then I'll ask the second? I would say in terms of financial practices, obviously the, the, the issues around collateral and when land is used as collateral, you know, in many contexts that, that, that excludes women in terms of those financial services. So how do you have non-land collateral, and certainly building up social collateral uh, through group lending, uh, I think, w and also in terms of village savings and loan associations, that is really building social collateral as well as building uh, financial assets. What was the second question? Second question from the same, um, same person. With regard to women not having access to financial data that is provided to men of the households, are there any attempts to develop an app or apps that will allow women to have access to said knowledge, or including women in contracts where men are the head of households? Um, I think CARE has done some really good work uh, in terms of how, you know, you know yesterday Peter Sang talked about systems, and he talked about we, have, we all grew up in a system, and that's our family systems. The reality is that of the children in the world, they are in family systems. So how do we work in, within households, intra-household financial decision making that is a benefit to the children? And only by having the males and female adult members, whether it's the mothers and fathers, the mother-in-laws and father-in-laws in those households working together well and having a system that is positive for the well-being of the children, thinking about the well-being of the children, and also building wealth status for the, uh, for the household. Uh, UNICEF came out uh, in 2007 and just came out again uh, with a, s a set of studies around if you increase, in terms of correlation of improved uh, wealth status of a household, reduces child vulnerability. So as we think about how can we have men and women, adult men and women, in a household improving the young men and women or the children, boys and girls in that household. So I would like to thank everyone both here uh, and uh, on the webcast around the world. Uh, this has been a wonderful journey working with Field and with Paul and his, his staff. Uh, to, to take a lot of the market-based systems and, and uh, apply them and how can we have uh, market systems to be more inclusive to the very poor. And I think as we move forward uh, looking at, uh, at different kinds of constructs and, and a very complex world, uh, and as we also think about the next 15 years in the uh, development agenda, we can have a contribution, I believe, in terms of the first goal of eliminating extreme poverty. So I would like to thank you so much. Great, thank you. All right, all the best. <laughs>